um, to the, our uh, uh, Egyptian friends, Sami Al Mosi, and our Indian friends, including Yasu Go, who is a patron, um, who have uh, collaborated with the World Federation of Surgical Societies, um, along with ACNS and Indian Society, to be part of this excellent uh, endoscopic retreat. Um, it's really my pleasure and honor to be present here. Uh, well, the concept of MI surgery is uh, performing surgeries when you need an access to surgical uh, deep surgical area. There's a path, and you take the surgical approach. Surgery is performed, and then you close the path. Despite following normal and natural path, surgeons inevitably destroy normal and functional tissue uh, and leave scars behind. And it's functionally inactive, so footprints are left behind, leading to problems. Um, and why should we do this? It reduces infection rate, reduce blood loss, uh, pain, reduce need for instrumentation inclusion, cost effective, uh, patient like it, allows patients in, uh, in patients, uh, surgery in patient group previously considered not suitable, like obese or highly morbid. Pitfalls is, uh, is there a long learning curve? We have looked into that, radiation exposure, equipment, and um, technique, and all that is important for us. Obviously, it doesn't help if you have the instrument and don't know the technique or are not aware of the anatomy. So you need to be looking at the fellowship programs, uh, cadaver courses, online courses, short-term observership. It works very, very well. And online resources and invite the faculty surgeons to your place. And this is a simple uh, but smaller problem. So you need to know the anatomy, where exactly the disc prolapse causes impingement of the nerve root. Well, is it the traversing route, the nerve route, or is it the exiting the nerve route? And that's important for us to understand. And you can see the majority of the this uh, prolapse come down and cause pressure on the um, uh, traversing, ex exiting the nerve route, and in this particular picture. Um, so, intervertebral disc uh, is function is to deform to uh, accommodate uh, compressive loads like nuclear fibrosis and resist inside and doors in stresses and you just that. And there is a gradual transition between nucleus and annulus. Now I'm going to go into detail of that. Um, so you can see like laminated boundary of intersegment uh, fibrous strands and the trapeze fibers penetrating uh, the, the cortical bone of the outer ring of the hand plate. All those fibers uh, blend with the periosteum and ALL and PLL. Uh, the end plate is, uh, is a concave depression, as shown here, and cartilage fill depression until the level of the margin are fixed. And you can see the intervertebral disc with this end plate cartilage, which goes on top of it uh, itself. So if you look at rostral to caudal, um, the cordage with end plate, lumbar spine, nucleus is dorsally um, uh, located. And when you have a disc bulge, the distraction on the Sharpie's fibers on both sides above and below. Uh, which causes bony osteophytes growth and stress on Sharpie's fibers, the greatest on the concave side, which is the side that uh, it collapses um, on the dorsal surface of the lumbar bodies. Roots and cauda equina, we know, are, are uh, placed in a so better type. So basically, we have the, in, the, in the midline, uh, we have the uh, medial most is the uh, circle and then lower number roots which go all the way down but the upper number roots are lacrimosa and so we need to know that anatomy and especially for our stimulation and the electrophysiology that's important so lateral research neural foramen inter foramen um, uh, root all this is important for us to understand if you have a far lateral disc that's going to impinge all the way out when you're out when the disc has come out all the way outside Whereas uh, paracentral disc is generally causes problem is uh, um, pushing where the disc itself is. So this fragment typically are at above or above the shoulder and requires medial retraction. So we immediately retract and then we can see the root itself. The lateral recess space, uh, this is a space as you can see here, um, is uh, the medial border is the fecal sac. And uh, lateral border is a medial perpendicular um, and medial pedicular plane at the level of upper and middle portion of the vertebral body. Posteriorly is the ligament and phlegm and the facet complex, and anteriorly is the vertebral body, a superior medial to neural foramen. And if you have stenosis, it's due because of hypertrophic joints or because of spondylosis. So here we can see a neural foramen. And it's it's border. So superiorly, as you can see, is pedicle of the same uh, vertebra. Anteriorly is the anterior portion of the vertebral body, 
in the vertebral disc is below that. And posteriorly, the superior articular process of the vertebra below, and inferior is the particle of the vertebra below. That's how the neural foramen is formed. And usually, if you can see, the root is lying on the upper side of um, that neural foramen. So you need to be wary of that. Sagittal cuts height more than width, and it's uh, oblong shape, as you can see here. So 12 to 19 millimeter height to 6 to 8 millimeter uh, width. Understanding anatomy, as we have said, that the group, uh, disc collapse itself comes down in most cases. So you need to be aware of the Camden's triangle, where exactly it is, and what are its boundaries. And I'm going to show you further um, that uh, the end plate, upper end plate, and lower end plate have to be clearly defined. So if you know where exactly the upper end plate and the lower end plate, then it's easier for you to dock um, your instruments. So for example, here, what we do is we it's like you uh, look at the oblique uh, x-ray and get the Scotty dog uh, appearance and you know we go exactly in the neck of the Scotty dog. And these D, we can see that we're already in and into the disk space itself and um and in and C itself is lateral image in line with the disk space. So then we know that where we are. The object is to enter into the uh, triangle, it's uh, three boundaries, you know, you should know very well. Uh, it's like the exiting nerve root lying laterally, and you have you have got the traversing uh, nerve root going medially, and you've got the superior end plate of the vertebra below. So the Camden's triangle is formed with that, and that's where you know where the exiting root is, or exactly you're going to be putting your needle if you're injecting there. Uh, so we remove the needle, guide serial dilator so over it. Occasionally, the superior articular process may be too big uh, and may be coming in our way, and we may have to drill it and to do a foraminoplasty to get inside. Uh, image acquisition is important that you have perfect AP uh, image. Otherwise, if you have an image like that, you can cause serious issues and you end up uh, in the wrong place, which you can't do. So, you need to have a good radiographer who knows what you want, and you know, maybe get a proper true lateral image before you enter it. And bioplanar awareness is important. So once we, are, we know that if in AP we are at this stage, we shouldn't be uh, crossing anywhere into the vertebral areas. Um, and once we are into uh, the medial part, we should be inside in the disc and not um, going uh, way forward or way less. Obviously, if you go way forward, then you're thinking you're probably not in the right place and you are you have gone in front of the vertebra causing serious uh, side effects. And then you use various instruments to um, decompress and take out the root, and it's the usual way that's done. The best way uh, to go about is your, your first patient has to be young, fit, slim patients. Uh, when you're starting out, L45 extruded paramedian disc is a good you know, way to go forward. Uh, try to have uh, a, a large foramen with minimum degeneration. Uh, obviously, anatomy variation is important. You need to look up the idea first if it's coming in your way or not. But this would be an ideal, ideal candidate to operate. So it's important to uh, understand and discuss that with your mentor or somebody who's trained you before you start doing this. So it is, um, again, I thank you for inviting me. And it's really my pleasure um, to be part of this, to give a small anatomy talk um, in this excellent um, uh, Congress. So I'm looking forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Dear friends, uh, this is Salman Sharif. I'm the chairperson for the WFNS Fine Committee. And I welcome you all on behalf of the Third World Congress on MIS and Endoscopic Spine Surgery. Thank you. Thank you. The next, we'll move on to the next talk, Dr. Luffy Gatam from Indonesia, Biportal Endoscopic Interlaminal Contralateral Discectomy and Foraminal. So, hi everyone. Thank you. Start. So, hi everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting me to the uh, World Endoscopic Meeting. So uh, today, I would like to talk about the biportal endoscopic interlaminal contralateral disectomy and the foraminal decompressions. As we know that the biportal endoscopic spine surgery gives effective results 
on neural decompression with minimal soft tissue injury compared with the open surgery. And this is uh, not really uh, not really new actually that uh, we know already about the uh, advantages of the endoscopic mice. The independent movement of scope and so many that uh, can give by the bipolar endoscopic is a wide range of initial view and instrument maneuver is really helpful for us doing the compression surgery. The similar anatomical visualization as the conventional open surgery is relatively short learning curve for surgeons who are familiar with open spinal surgery. So the biportal is very helpful for doing the compressions. So uh, as we know that the degenerative spine disease as a multiple source of mechanical neural compression, such as uh, ligament and flaphant thickening, these herniations, central placental foramen, extra foramen, these degenerations, and reduce this high uh, result in the compression, uh, uh, decreasing of the foramen size, that uh, the result will uh, the uh, compression of the nerve root. And stable or unstable spondylolisthesis also decreasing of the, will decrease the foramenal size. The results will have a central or lateral results of stenosis, foramenal stenosis, or both central or lateral results and foramenal stenosis. And as we know also that the foramenal decompression technique, uh, there are several techniques such as uh, wheel seat approach. This is a classic one that uh, we can do from the lateral through the muscles and, and doing the uh, decompression through the uh, tube that we can uh, decompression from the uh, doing the uh, burning of the facet joint and we uh, have the foramenal uh, side, then we can do a decompression at the side. Yeah, the, the endoscopic approach provides uh, provide better visualizations and less money where compared with the open technique. And we, uh, what other problem with paraspinal approach? It will cause the facet violation, violations, and especially in more proximal level. Yeah, and talking about endoscopic interlaminal control of sectomy and foraminotomy, it is one of the uh, choice that you can do actually, and uh, uh, it will uh, easily access and it easily uh, the compression of the uh, stenosis. And if you look at the uh, the indications, the indication of doing that procedure is central and lateral. Uh, recess stenosis with foraminal stenosis and central lateral recess stenosis with contralateral lateral palmar central or foraminal disseminations. And if we're talking about more proximal, L2, let's say just L2, L3, or L3, 4, uh, we can do paracentral or foraminal dissemination or foraminal stenosis. And also, we can do stable spondylolisthesis, even in stable spondylolisthesis, of the foraminal decompressions uh, using the uh, procedures. This is one of the sample female, 70 years old, with the left as one left side lateral recess and foraminal stenosis. And if you look at the uh, picture, that the there is a stenosis at the L5S1 here. So uh, there is a alpha S1 stenosis at that side. So uh, both side alpha S1 lateral stenosis and more severe at the left side. Left side foraminal stenosis as well. And this is uh, the uh, and this, the picture, the movie of the endoscopy. So we can do laminotomy first, and uh, then. Contralateral side of the uh, the contralateral side of the foraminotomy and flavum removal and after flavum removal the contralateral recess deep compressions yeah and we can see the uh, the SAP here and after uh, the SAP then we can see that the 
foraminal. And the foraminal uh, is already decompressed. The, if you look here. So it's here, the foraminal really decompression. So uh, actually, uh, it is really possible doing the contralateral uh, decompressions. So another example, well, male 40 years old, L34, uh, lumbar stenosis and these herniations. If you look here, there is a stenosis at the, uh, at the central one, yeah. And uh, also the uh, recessed stenosis of L34, both side and central right paracentral, uh, these herniations. So if you look here, we can see that uh, we can do the laminotomy first, and after that, the contralateral side of the uh, the genesis will be decompression and platform removal, and also you can find this uh, at the contralateral side, and we can do a disectomy at that side, yeah, the contralateral side. So after that, we do the the conversions of the uh, foraminal stenosis. This is another 64 years old with the uh, foraminal disherniation R34. And if you look here, this is a disherniation. And we do the uh, contralateral uh, decompressions. And the type that so if you look here, we just remove the uh, sublaminary uh, osteotomy first. Yeah, then we can see the uh, contralateral side of the uh, SAP, and we remove it. Then we just uh, take out the uh, this macro. So another example, female, 69 years old, right side L5, S1, foraminal stenosis, L4, 5, lateral recess stenosis. And then we do the, the conversions, contralateral, contralateral side, so L5, S1, contralateral foraminal tomy, then L4, 5, contralateral, lateral recess decompressions. And this is the uh, movie of that, so we can do the uh, from the contralateral. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 18 patients undergone uh, biportal endoscopic uh, spinal steroid interlaminal contralateral sectomy and foraminotomy. Back pain and leg pain were significantly reduced after the, the procedures. And uh, if you're talking about the complications, no major complications was found. Two cases of hypoesthesia after the procedures, one case motor neuropraxia, but uh, fully recovered after several times, no past fractures in the surgery. The technical point, careful assessment of the spinal level and anatomical pathology of nerve is very important and precise skin institutions would make surgery easier, perform adequate base, spinous, and sublaminary uh, bone resections. And the exact superior tip of SAP uh, side curve tissue will be benefit for that. So uh, it's a very important thing that you have to have uh, uh, tools for that. And high vascularity in foraminal area, use low temperature radiofrequency abductor is very uh, important. This is one of the other uh, journal. Uh, look here, there is a journal talking about the contralateral sites and easier done rather than uh, you do the uh, epsilon one. So uh, another uh, journal talking about uh, the, these procedures and in 2017 and 26 patients by portal uh, contralateral sites and uh, they have a, a, a good excellent outcome after the surgery. And the and 22, uh, 27 patients by portal as well, and they have 96% good excellent outcome. 
and in 21, uh, so uh, 48 patients, uh, they have a, a good excellent outcome as well. So conclusions, bioportal endoscopic interlaminal contralisectomy and foraminal decomposition is an effective technique and the advantages for the technique better personalization is compared with open surgery, less bony resections, preservation of parts in the articular, able to decompress both central and foraminal stenosis in one single entry. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Next talk is again virtual. Record it. Next talk. Record it. So we move on to the next by Dr. Armentia Mahafirifazia from Indonesia. N block lumbar phlegm extraction in endoscopic spine surgery. A technical note. So my topic today is about N-block lumbar phlegm extraction in endoscopic spine surgery. So as you all know, you are all familiar with endoscopic spine surgery that has continued to gain popularity in the past decade. And one of the key of success for endoscopic spine surgery is adequate and safe decompression of neural elements. Spinal stenosis is one of the most problems that we encounter and needed to remove the flaphom ligament. The option of removing the flaphom ligament is using piece by piece by kerosene punch or end block technique flaphom removal. So why do I choose end block flaphom removal? During my experience of endoscopic spine surgery, I often encounter a dural tear. And all of the incidents of my dural tear is by using the kerosene. So, I would like to reduce the use of kerosene by adapting the end block technique. So we often see the MRI severe stenosis patient like this. What do we have to keep in mind when, when we are facing with severe stenosis like as shown as the MRI, we predict that the flaphom ligament may attach to the dura. So removing the platform ligament will be tricky if you use a piece by piece removing of the platform ligament. And using a keratin punch will increase the risk of dural tear. So by using a biportal endoscopic, the starting point is the inferior edge of the upper lamina. So you can start your way by drilling the inferior margin of the upper lamina and you continue to drill the lamina until you see the flaphom ligament. Try to search the cranial attachment of the flaphom ligament and one of the key to identify is you should identify the central path of the flaphom ligament which I will show you like this. This is the central path of the flaphom ligament. When you identify the central path, you can easily know which one is the true midline of the flaphom ligament. This is the midline. Okay. And after you finish removing the cranial attachment of the flaphom ligament, you can make your way to the caudal attachment of the flaphom ligament. And as you all know, caudal attachment of the flaphom ligament is separated by two 
one attached to the superficial part of the upper lamina and one is the deep part of the lower lamina and removing the superficial attachment should be easy using uh, ablation and after you see the bone on the upper part of the lower lamina you can easily drill it and try to find the cranial attachment of the platform ligament after you finish working on the caudal side you continue to the contralateral side on the contralateral side you may have to remove part of the medial facets as long as you don't remove 50 percent of the medial facets it's okay so you can also easily detach the superficial attachment of the platform ligament on the lower lamina using ablation like i said before and you can use a dissector to remove the contralateral attachment of the platform ligament as shown as my video here so you notice that i don't use keratin punch because in my opinion, using Carson punch will increase incidence of dural tear. So you can easily remove the attachment using a dissector. This is the, crown, the contralateral part, and this is the ipsilateral part. Now you can see the traversing nerve roots, and you continue to release all of the attachment of the flapon ligament using a dissector. And after you sure that you already remove all the attachment of the platform ligament, the platform ligament could easily be removed by uh, by end block using a forceps. Make sure there is no no addition to the dura, so you can safely remove the platform ligament using a forceps like I show you in my video here. So after you remove the platform ligament, you can see the neural elements is fully decompressed. You can see the contralateral traversing nerve roots, ipsilateral traversing nerve roots, and also the dural side. So this is the look when you are removing the platform ligament. Sometimes it's difficult to remove the platform ligament because the size is bigger than your incision. So you may have to make a little bit maneuver, toggling the forceps to make the platform ligament came out from your incision. After you remove, you can see the platform ligament is removed nicely and locked. It's not piece by piece. It's a hole. So this is the look when you remove successfully the fluff on ligament using end block technique. This is from the posterior part and this is from the anterior part. And also MRI, MRI reveal adequate uh, neural element decompression. So I'll make a small study back on 2021. I divided my patient into two groups. One, I did the platform removal using piece by piece using Carson punch. And the second group, I used uh, unblock technique. And the mean time of surgery using unblock technique is much faster. And for dural tear complication, I didn't encounter any dural tear complication when I use end block technique platform removal. So the result by adapting the end block technique, time of surgery for a single level stenosis will be decreased by 38%. And no dural tear complication when using end block technique. Thank you. Thank you very much.
So we end here first session. So after the excellent first session, let's go on to the next session with Dr. Saifruddin Hussain. Can you please start the talk? Yes. Please. He'll be talking on endoscopic approach to vertilote syndrome. Can we please have the talk? I sent the video to Dr. Malcolm already. Sir, who morning after video page at the Malcolm Sunday, Shakuji no center. Who video name will rest a kitter? सर के इसमें मैं यहां से प्ले करता हूं इधर होना था हां बट इधर किधर है वो वीडियो वो सर इट्स गेटिंग प्लेड पारस सर के पास है वो नेक्स्ट कर लेना yeah so uh, right now we are just trying to get hold of the talk and we'll continue with the next talk by dr ashrafi iski gatam from indonesia he'll be talking on endoscopic approach of facet joint cyst and we'll play the talk of dr saifud after this thank you please please the talk Is Dr. Ashtrafi with us right now? Yeah, hello. Hi, greetings from India. Dr. Ashrafi? Yes, uh, I have already sent my video presentation video. Yes, so we are just trying to play it. <laughs> we, are just I'm sorry? Play. we are trying to play it. We'll play it in a moment. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Can you show me? 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 Can you so Dr. Ashrafi, while we are waiting to play your talk, can you tell us about how many uh, facet cysts and how frequently do you encounter which you need a surgical intervention? Dr. Ashrafi? Sorry, can you can you repeat the question? So, how frequently do you encounter facet joint cyst for which you need a surgical intervention? Because we see it routinely and most of them are not symptomatic. So, the incidence and prevalence of, you know, surgical facet cyst which you need to operate. Well, uh, basically, it is quite rare for, for, for me to find uh, facet joint cysts. Uh, but 
uh, when I have uh, facet joints, yes, most of the time, we we uh, the patient has the symptoms for probably for radiculopathy or uh, uh, flow decation. So that's why uh, usually the facet joints, yes, which uh, protrude into the spinal canal, yeah. usually it's an, a surgical intervention. So endoscopy is uh, has a lot of uh, advantages uh, for managing of facet joints mm -hmm. because we have a better view for uh, uh, for the facet joints. Uh, so for the cyst itself. And have you seen any recurrences mm -hmm. after a long term follow for this kind of cyst? The, you mean the follow-up? No, the recurrence of the cyst, because it's said that uh, facet cysts are a sign of instability at that particular level. So that's the reason of the cyst. And uh, just excising, they have known that they can recur over a period of time. So have you any experience with that? So uh, you mean, you mean the, um, uh, the, the instability after the surgery, right? Yes, yes. Yes, is that, that's what you're asking, right? So yes, yes. I have, uh, I, I, I never had any problem with instability after the surgery for uh, facet, facet cyst uh, excision because uh, I, I do most of the facet cyst excision surgeries using the endoscopy. So basically, I preserve all the muscles and most of the ligaments on the posterior part. So I only open up a little bit of the flavum ligament from the inside. And also, uh, the in, the inside of the facet joints. Uh, usually, I I also I also expose the inside of the facet joints only on the uh, sides that uh, that the cyst is uh, is connected into the facet joints. So I I never open uh, both of the facet joints. So I guess uh, the stability it's not a matter of problem after the surgeries. I guess. So you're not any have had any issues with you know later on you need to stabilize after a few years regarding these cases that's what you are saying right i'm sorry can you can you repeat again the question yeah so what you are inferring is after facet six excision you've never had any incidences where you need to stabilize in the future like in a couple of years down the line because of no 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 never i i, I never had uh, an experience with that Great, super. We are just trying to figure out your talk. So where is it and in the meanwhile? If you want to share some more thoughts about your experience of SNSs, that would be more than welcome. Uh, can, can, you, can you find my presentation? Yesterday I sent it to Telegram, I guess. Just a couple of minutes. We are just trying to figure it out. Okay. Well, <laughs> Krishna. Why? 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 Why?
Doctor Ashwati, uh, we are having uh, trouble. So, do you have a talk with you in hand right now, which you can share it on Zoom? Possible, or you can share your laptop screen. Would that be possible, Doctor Ashwati? Hello. Receive it, no. Automating the interview is done. So, could you please uh, accept me? Uh, I'm already logging in with my laptops now. Yeah, please. Thank you so much. If you can share your screen for your talks. Yeah, yeah. I need uh, because I, but right now uh, I'm on my phone at the moment. Okay. So I, I, I already asked for uh, for login in with the app. Can can some please accept me? Okay, then. 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 Can someone please authorize me for so I can share my screen? Yeah, we are doing that right now. I think we have made your co-host right now. You can just see. No. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm still disabled for, for screen sharing. Yeah. Okay, all right. I can share my screen now. Yeah, please start. Yes.